Good evening, New Zealand. Good morning, Europe. Good afternoon to the West Coast of the United States of America. I suppose this is close enough to prime time in New York City. Um, better time than usual for my viewers in uh, Australia and New Zealand. I'm going to start with a, a short letter from the audience. So I get email, I get messages in various forms, but this was actually the thank you note that was included with this copy of a heavy tome on the My Lai Massacre. And yes, by the way, although I have studied Cambodian, Laotian, Pali, numerous languages, modern Thai, numerous languages of Southeast Asia and Asia, I did double check. What is the pronunciation? Is it My Lai or is it My Lai? It's in fact pronounced My Lai. It's the My Lai Massacre. Uh, it's a book that's actually bigger and heavier than I was expecting. There may be a shallow point, but if you think about buying the book, it's a serious consideration. I thought this was going to be a little pocket-sized novel, to be perfectly honest with you. Anyway, so this is the latest and presumably definitive scholarly work on the history of the My Lai Massacre. I, I have not read it, obviously, but we received today with this note from the viewer from the audience. And the first thing he says is actually quite moving to me. He says, fan since Game of Thrones. So I mean, you guys may not remember... But there was a time when Game of Thrones was really a significant source of inspiration to me. Not so much the TV show. I could even say not so much the books on print. I used to listen to the audiobooks not of the works of George R. R. Martin in general, not just Game of Thrones. I used to listen to them when doing push-ups and lifting weights at the gym. Maybe that's what my workout is lacking right now. Maybe I should get back to listening to, to George R. R. Martin. And I was, I was lifting weights very heavily in those days, which I'm not at the moment, in case you hadn't guessed. But, you know, when you're really lifting at your limit, you then sit there out of breath, you know, between sets and so on. I remember going through that, that literature. And, you know, we all went through the tragedy of what happened with the television adaptation, which basically got worse and worse and worse as the years went on. But that was, adds up to quite a few years of my life. I started watching that show when my daughter was a newborn infant, and now she's a fully grown human being. Um, anyway, yeah, so it's interesting, but this is someone who's been watching my YouTube channel since the days when I discussed Game of Thrones. And for me, what was so interesting about that series of books and so on had a lot to do with politics. Uh, politics, critique of religion, and so on and so forth also. And it was just this fan since Game of Thrones. Here are two topic suggestions that would be fun. Personality tests like MBTI. So MBTI is the notorious Mayor's Briggs uh, personality test. So, yeah, Melissa is nodding right now. So now you have heard of this. Oh, yeah. Right, a lot so. of people put it in their Instagram profiles. <laughs> as obvious as that is, I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that. So she says that people give their personality profile and their Instagram profile. I guess I have, have uh, seen that. I was going to say it's the topic of innumerable sort of cosmopolitan magazine articles. It's the, the stuff of pop psychology in this in this sense. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll leave out the rest of his, his comment. I'll treat the rest of it as, as private. But you know, one of the most fundamental things, I say this to my girlfriend, I say this to my mom, I say this to my personal friends, and I say this to my enemies on the internet too in the middle of debates, is that you know, I think of philosophy as a problem solving method. And to some extent also over time, over the centuries, you know, you have the accumulation and comparative study of many problem solving methods. Like you look at Buddhist philosophy and think about how that shapes society in contrast to Catholic and Muslim philosophy and atheist philosophy. So, you know, at some point you get the, you get a kind of meta philosophy, the philosophy of philosophy. But fundamentally, why do we do philosophy? Why do we think philosophically? It's to solve problems and it's not to create problems. And I think that this type of personality test, first and foremost, is a great example of people creating jargon for the sake of creating jargon, people creating problems for the sake of creating problems. You're creating these distinctions, really invidious distinctions, if taken seriously, between different personality types. And for what and why? To solve what problem? And I'll give you a hypothetical. It's not so hard to relate to. What if the Air Force is trying to distinguish between the people who drop out of the program and people who succeed. They say, well, you know what? Every year we recruit 200 people into this pilot training program. And so many of them, they just for one reason or another, give up. And then there are these other people who succeed. An even better example would be the submarine service. It's something like above 95% of the men who think they've got what it takes to be in the submarine service and who get through the initial program of rigorous testing, like something like 95% can't 
cope with being on a submarine. It's a very small percentage of men. So you might say, okay, let's let's take this new science or this new philosophy of personality tests and let's try to figure out what type of person, you know, can hack it in the Air Force, what kind of person can succeed in the Navy and the submarine service. And this this would solve the problem for us, right? So that would be a, a I think a really serious philosophical and ultimately scientific approach to personality tests. Okay. Some people succeed at learning languages and some people fail. And now I could add to this a long paragraph of what conditions we're talking about. When I lived in Thailand, my boss, so I used to work in the publishing industry, nonfiction publishing. I was an editor of nonfiction books. I guess I guess I should start hyping up that part of my background more now that I'm identifying with hashtag booktube, right? And like hashtag <laughs> bookstagram. Now that I'm on those hashtags, I should emphasize that I'm a former, former nonfiction editor. But anyway, I was at this uh, remarkable nonfiction publishing house uh, based in, in Thailand. And my boss, he'd been there for decades and decades. And he labored with such fundamental errors in the Thai language. Like his errors were mind blowing to me. You know what I mean? And uh, I'm sorry, I, I've probably told this anecdote before, maybe five years ago on the channel or something, but it would be things like, you know, there was a name for a certain type of building, like a certain type of municipal office building. So it's not quite the mayor's office, but it's a certain type of government office. And he thought that was the name of the city that the building was located in. There were all these weird errors he had. And I remember one of them was, a, was again, just a place name, a toponym that was literally written on the side of the highway. Like, and it wasn't just one sign. Like he was driving past this sign like 10 times a day, every day for more than 10 years. And he had this place name wrong. I'm just not giving the particular place names because you know, I don't want to, I don't want to dox people, whatever. I'm not going to give away his address or something. But like there are all these kind of mind blowing language areas. Live with, and you think, okay, so I've been here for a short time and working hard in the language. Like really, really I've been studying for a very short time. And I'm, I'm catching all these things and you've been here for all these years. So, you know, you could try to devise a personality test that solves this problem. Now, my former boss, the guy I'm talking about in town, so he was a white German who moved to Thailand and been there for decades. And, you know, in some ways he could use the language well, but you could say incredibly sloppy with incredibly poor accuracy. And, you know, he, he slept with prostitutes and uh, lived a very... He had he had what the French might call joie de vivre. You know, he enjoyed his life on his terms in a way that I wouldn't. He was a bit of a brute sensualist, and he was a very self confident person. Uh, he didn't care if he hurt other people's feelings. He didn't care if he, he he was not sensitive to other people in that way, and so on. He he lived a kind of brash, reckless life, treading on everyone's toes, including his own, and a brash, reckless life sexually and in every other way. Um, so very stark contrast to me at that time, I was a scholar of Buddhism leading this very tightly disciplined, controlled, self-examined life and so on. So you could try to assess the difference between our personalities and say, well, okay, a certain type of personality is noticing these errors really sharp on the details and a certain type of personality is kind of reckless and sloppy. And there's a sense in which he's learned the language, he's able to communicate but he's getting things wrong all the time. It doesn't notice it. Yeah, it, it seems as if you could start to put together something that's both philosophically valuable and has some scientific validity for the army, for the Navy, for language education, maybe for the teachers also, the different personality types of teachers, all right? And absolutely none of this can be said for the Myers-Briggs personality test. Absolutely nothing like this can be said for any of the psychological profiling and personality tests of our time. And one of the most telling aspects is that these personality tests do not include any negative traits. <laughs> How about laziness, right? Does laziness show up in your personality test? Now, again, not to insult anyone who has dyslexia, right? But if you were doing this study, whether for the military or for language, a condition like is dyslexia, you can call that part of your personality or not. It would be crucially important to measure something like dyslexia. And well, this isn't part of personality. My introduction to um, the strange world of pseudoscientific personality tests was finding a tome on a bookshelf in a secondhand bookstore in Toronto, Canada, a big, heavy tome. And it was the famous Minnesota 
personality index test, which is MMPI. Oh, so Melissa's heard of this. Yeah. Uh, when I worked for the psychologist. So you have some professional experience. Uh, he would he? interview big patients. And he'd use this point scoring system, the MMPI. Yes, point I actually yeah. had to enter in all the data. The data. So I saw all the test right. questions right. many, many times. So I, I had this tome that I bought secondhand. And it, it was the collected life stories of MMPI profilees, people who've been profiled. And I forget the original purpose was to do something like profile them in grade six, and then again in grade nine, and then again at the end of high school, this kind of thing. It was, you know, and to describe the personalities and so on. And it was so tragic. I think the first entry I read, selling it to some other topics I'd like to discuss today, if the audience is into it, but I think the first entry I read was about a First Nations girl, an American Indian girl, and describes her whole terrible life, you know, in the midst of genocide. And, everything. and it's trying to describe her personality. It's like, well, you know, obviously she's a person of resilience and boldness. And she was born in these terrible circumstances. And this was her mother and this was her father. And, you know, this unbelievable struggle to overcome, you know, the, the terrible circumstances. And, you know, she does, she does really badly in school. But when the teachers are asked about it, the teachers will say, oh, well, it's not because she's stupid. You know, she's a bright kid, but she comes from a tough background. So, you know, like so you got this kind of fascinating, emotionally moving profile of this girl and this series of numbers. And of course, you could take the series number. This was what the book was created for. So you could see what the numbers meant in practice. And then you could look up another profile for a boy the same age who got the same rating, the same numbers. It says, you know, uh, Jim was a dull boy. None of his teachers thought he was uh, particularly interesting or intelligent. <laughs> it's just described as a boring person. By the way, that's all they did. They interviewed the kid and they interviewed a couple of the kid's teachers. And uh, I think so, maybe a couple of their schoolyard friends or something. Asked, when asked about in the school board, nobody thought he was a distinctive one way or the other. And like some of the profiles, that's all they said. It was like, this kid is nondescript. There's nothing interesting about this kid. <laughs> I mean, um, and, you know, of course, some of them was like, oh, this kid is already an alcoholic or what have you. And the, the point is, when you compared the narrative data about these children or the teenagers, because as I recall, it went to the end of high school or something, uh, to, you know, this set of numbers that was supposedly quantifying their personality. It, of course, it completely, you know, revealed how, how ridiculous this, this attempt to quantify personality. Yeah, but so, you know, so uh, it, it is interesting even here, people are still using MMPI, the Minnesota yes, uh, personality. Yes, yeah. the clients who are doing child custody evaluations. So right. he would interview adults. How crazy they are, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So this was, they did show some negative yeah. characters, like some yeah. negative traits. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. So it's interesting you're still being used diagnostically. Well, I was reminded that it hadn't completely disappeared from the world because it is considered debunked. Old fashioned, it is. I mean, I'm just saying, it's not the state of the art in the in the business. Jordan Peterson does not use the MMPI, for example. Um, he uses the Big Five personality test and so on. Yeah. But um, I remember there was an episode of The Simpsons. It is the episode in which the secret origin of Ned Flanders is revealed, and it extensively makes fun of the MMPI system. So yeah, anyway, this is the question I had in from the audience: is what I thought about these types of of personality tests. And I think you can tell part of what I'm suggesting to you is that there is a tragedy here, that there is the potential for something scientifically valid and meaningful and philosophically rigorous, you know, to come out of these kinds of questions. But they have to be posed as questions, and that's not what we're doing here. We're starting with a solution and then proliferating problems and proliferating jargon and proliferating categories that have absolutely no problem-solving value. So, you know, if you want to know specifically about Myers-Briggs, my assertion here is that the Myers-Briggs profiling system will not in any way differentiate who will succeed and who will fail in the American military. It will not in any way help you to differentiate who will be a good language student, who will be a good language teacher, or an even better question, what type of language teacher would be best suited to what type of language student? That could be fantastic research to do. So, okay, well, this is the kind of kid who doesn't, or forget kids, do this with adults. This is the kind of adult who, you know, is naturally not sociable and not, you know, prone to speaking. So they need a teacher who's going to encourage them to speak. Obviously, you could come up with some really useful, you know, conclusions of this kind. Alas, this is not, uh, this is not the way of, of science in our times. And it's not the way of Cosmopolitan magazine. So it's, anyway, it's a great uh, tragedy that what goes on in universities, on the one hand, 
is not really linked to research and on the other hand is not really linked to education. So following up on Melissa's video, you might want to write this down for the timestamp. Following up on Melissa's video, I had one longtime uh, viewer uh, right into the channel and he objected at first. He said, no, I, I disagree with what Melissa's doing in her video. There's the scientific evidence that music education is fantastically productive. No. And uh, he didn't get angry at me, but I really made fun of him and really insulted him in terms of this. And I, it only took a couple Google searches to find out what the source of this information was. And it's this shameful, you know, perception of music laboratory in Montreal attached to McGill. And it's, this is really what universities have become today. And it's this guy who's a snake oil salesman who's had a best-selling book. He's had a book on the New York Times bestseller list about how music education has all these wonderful effects for you. He has this laboratory where he does experiments such as having you immer immerse your hand in a bucket of ice cold water while listening to one kind of music and then have you immerse your hand in a bucket of ice cold water while listening to a different kind of music and see how well you endure the pain and listen to different I, I, you know, none of it proves anything all of it's just to excite and entice the you know get you know get people you know buying his new york times best selling book Yes, getting getting no no getting people to donate to the university, right? It's fundraising for the university. This is the kind of show business side of academia today, which again, it neither has to do with real research nor does it have to do with yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, obviously, there's a lot of self justification in these claims that the study of music will make you more intelligent or something. But in this case, there was a whole another layer of scam. Anyway, the the long time viewer of the channel, uh, I think I'm sure that was Andreas out in, in Los Angeles. That was guy who wrote it to me. I don't think he'll be embarrassed here to be shouted about. And he seemed to concede the point. I think he felt like he'd watched this TED talk or heard this thing that was quoting this book and he assumed this was real science. And the moment you Googled it and the moment you looked into it, you uh, you know. So okay, so uh, guys I'm happy to ask questions from the audience. Um, yeah, anyway, Nacho Business comments about the Big Five personality test. I do not want to get into the Big Five personality test. Um, I could easily make a YouTube video discussing the Big Five personality test. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think you can guess uh, what kind of critical direction it's taking. Uh, James writes in and asks, Eisel, I'm curious to hear your opinion of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and your opinion of Canada's mainstream political parties. Well, it's great that you should ask that. So just today, I produced my incredibly sophisticated and elaborate taxonomy of uh, Canadian democracy. So I'm going to give you the link to that right now. You can see this in-depth diagram that in one image, in one postage stamp size image, exhaustively and in great detail explains to you my analysis of how Canadian democracy works or it doesn't work. So th this diagram, for those of you at home who are not clicking on the link to not see it, it divides Canadian politics six ways. The pro-CBC left, the pro-CBC right, the pro-CBC center, and then the anti-CBC left, anti-CBC right, anti-CBC center. This is my uh, this is my proposal for understanding uh, Canadian politics. Look, guys, um, a lot of what I've been writing about lately, so I'm still answering your question, James. This is still in reply to your question about the prime minister. You know, a lot. Hi, Lydia. Hi, Natasha. Nice to see you here. Uh, nice that you're here at this time of day. I was hoping we get some people from New Zealand, but we'll see. <laughs> uh, I guess New Zealand is also celebrating the end of coronavirus quarantine and are out dancing around in the sunshine or what have you for the first time. But for I know right now my whole YouTube channel has fewer views because you know, this is this is not a time people want to be sitting at home listening to morality lectures. <laughs> and for me, morality lectures never go out of season. <laughs> Uh, okay, sorry. So the question about uh, Justin Trudeau and the, uh, the Canadian political system. A lot of what I'm writing about right now for my book, No More Manifestos, buy your copy, make a down payment, mortgage your house. Um, I'm writing this book, uh, No More Manifestos. A lot of what it deals with is the problem that so much of our political discourse is focused on the moral quality of a person's character and not on their actual political responsibilities, how the system works, or what, what it is they're supposed to deliver or accomplish if we vote for them or if we elect them. Like, what is it you are exchanging your, your vote for? Now, for the most part, in our culture and in our political systems, plural, um, all we can say for ourselves is that we voted for the person we felt was morally superior with no expectation, no understanding of what what they would do in return, no commitment from them, what they would do. And, you know, give very easy to understand example. Most people felt they were electing Barack Obama 
to close down the torture chambers in Iraq and in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. So at that time, those of you who aren't old enough or those of you who weren't following American politics, th those may now seem like minor footnotes in history. But those were huge issues right at the time Barack Obama was elected. And people thought the first day he came into office, there'd be some kind of decisive change that would end the use of torture and close down those specific facilities uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, but in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, above all else. Now, what did Barack Obama do in Afghanistan and in Iraq, it is very fair to say that he continued and expanded on the policies of George W. Bush. There wasn't some kind of sudden shift in policy. You know that the war, in one sentence, the war continued, and uh, many of the you know distinctive strate strategic approaches of uh, George W. Bush, for instance, the use of drone strikes, which left wing people did not like. I, by the way, I'm not. I'm not a stereotypical left-wing person. There are many things people on the left say that I don't particularly agree with. I think the hysteria about drone strikes was misplaced. It was based on a misunderstanding of the technology and war. But in any case, the people who voted for Barack Obama, they hated drone strikes. They were morally opposed to drone strikes. I'm not, but, you know, and they thought that was going to change. And no, it was massively expanded under Obama. There were more drone strikes. Than so even, I don't know if you guys remember this, there was a particular artist uh, the, who made iconic posters for Obama. And they were Obama's face uh, with the word hope and a very distinctive color scheme. And he proposed that he redo the poster with the word drones instead of the word. So this just shows at that time, this was really perceived as a big deal. Now, what could anyone say? Oh, well, they voted for Obama because they felt morally and ethically he was the better person than the alternative. But there's no particular commitment. You know, the moral and intellectual quality of our leaders matters. And my opinion of Justin Trudeau, if that is what you are asking me, is that he is morally and intellectually a bad person. I think he is stupid and immoral. All right. I don't think Justin Trudeau has read Aristotle. I don't think Justin Trudeau has read Thucydides. I don't think he's read anything else to compensate. I think he is someone who was born rich and became lazy and got a little bit too comfortable a little bit too early in life. He has been photographed partying in blackface repeatedly. Um, he himself admitted he does not know how many times he wore blackface. And this was not such ancient history. This wasn't in the 1930s or something. You know, <laughs> he's not that old, you know, and it, it wasn't that many years ago. But I mean, in every way, you know, including this, it is an indication. I'm sorry for any of you in the audience. Okay. Alexa, how old is Justin Trudeau? Justin Trudeau is 49 years old. Okay, Alexa, stop. Okay, Justin Trudeau is 49. Okay, I'm 42. Okay, it's not ancient. Any of you in the audience who are in your 40s, did you did you did you wear blackface? At a party, like repeatedly, did you dress up in blackface? You know, I'm sorry. I know this is a kind of uh, you know uh, small and symbolic indication of how stupid a guy the guy the, the guy is. But yes, I that is really genuinely my moral and intellectual evaluation of the guy. Now it's interesting to note I met with one of my Chinese professors at the University of Victoria right around the time Justin Trudeau won the election. Uh, so this is someone who is ethnically Chinese, as well as being an expert in Chinese politics. So, you know, he's a professor who is Chinese and who studies and teaches uh, things Chinese. And I remember he said to me with this very worried expression on his face, he said, you know, all of my friends, probably his friends are all left-wing academics, they're all excited and hopeful about, you know, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, about this new and different Prime Minister. You know. And he said, uh, uh, but I'm not, and you know, English is a second language. I think he just said, I'm not, I think it's bad. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, I, I smiled at him. We knew each other pretty well. I wouldn't say we're close friends or something. We'd talked many times. I said, I think it's bad also. <laughs> it started in this kind of very ESL way, you know, um, you know, uh, <laughs> and we talked about how low our expectations were. Uh, for Justin Trudeau. So yeah, uh, you know, unfortunately, I do think Justin Trudeau is a bad person and a stupid person. He came into office with an incredibly vague set of promises 
And, you know, aside from massively increasing the bankruptcy of Canada, I mean, massively overspending, being really, you know, economically irresponsible, what indeed do we have to show? What are the accomplishments of his time in office? And I think when he leaves, we can ask this same question. Now, you know, a real contrast here is Joe Biden. Joe Biden had the most shocking first hundred days in office, certainly during my lifetime. He really came to office with an amazing list of things he wanted to do, not just to change the United States of America, but to change the rest of the world. Now, I don't know if Joe Biden has another hundred days in it. Just I'm skeptical. Maybe for the rest of Joe Biden's time in office, he's going to accomplish nothing. Maybe nothing's really going to change. Possible. But, you know, that was someone who came with a very strong sense of mission and mandate and purpose. And he's already really changed the world forever. And he's changed life in the United States of America forever. And he may he may continue to do so. But, uh, you know, Justin Trudeau did not come into office with any such agenda. Obviously, his ability to do anything since the start of uh, the coronavirus quarantine period has been very limited. But he accomplished nothing before that. And now he's just in an endless cycle of making excuses for his having failed to accomplish anything. And sorry, also, for those of you who are not Canadian and don't already know, I haven't been talking about this. But yes, there is a there is at least one corruption scandal with him. I, I would say there are two I'm confident in saying he's guilty of. You know, there have been misdeeds of that kind with, uh, with him in power and so on. And those, you know, the details of those scandals are very boring, but they reflect these fundamental problems, both those moral, his moral character, his intellectual character. And, you know, then we can say in this sense, his, uh, his political character. Okay, guys. So I'm I'm happy to talk. I'm happy to talk about whatever you guys are talking about the audience. But I also do have my own list of things to talk about. Uh, many of them being books, books that I've bought, books that I've read or that I haven't read. So this book was given to me by a mem member of the audience. He's already been thanked. But I say I haven't read this yet. If you want to read this along with me, if you want to read it, and we'll talk about it on live streams, right? Uh, this is an opportunity. This is a chance. So, you know, I just say you, you, the fact that I'm going to talk about books I haven't read yet or that I've only read a little bit about creates the possibility of a different kind of audience interaction. And, you know, so this is a book I will be talking about on future episodes. If you order it from Amazon or get it ordered from the library, you probably get this for free from the library. Guys. Uh, we can suffer through it together and, you know, maybe I'll reflect on things. Okay. Oh, yes. Good point. Uh, sorry, I just assume everyone knows already. So first name Howard, last name Jones, Howard Jones. And I should say, you know what? I can give you guys that link too. There is actually an interview with him. Maybe that's too boring. Yeah, I guess I won't. Okay. There is a podcast interviewing the guy that I enjoyed, but you know what? It is a pretty boring interview. Uh, but if you look around, you, maybe you can find some more interesting because he, he did do some interviews and podcasts to promote the book uh, when it was new, as so many authors do in this day and age. Um, oh, we actually have an insane troll in the audience who is not Fandar. How, what a, <laughs> that's, that's a change. Okay. <laughs> guys, I'm seeing some messages you guys aren't seeing, by the way, because YouTube automatically censors this stuff. And then I, if I don't click to uncensor it, it stays censored. So depending on different, uh, different keywords, things do get uh, censored out. So I just mentioned, sorry, this is not uh, not doing anything in a particular order, but in terms of the book club, um, another book that I'm still at the, the first impression stage with, I think you can read that right off the camera, uh, right, off, right off the screen, The Plot to Kill King, The Truth Behind the Assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., the final book on this uh, topic from William Pepper Esquire. Um... Okay, this guy devoted his life or many decades of his life to researching and talking about the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. This is published by Skyhorse Publishing Incorporated. It doesn't really sound like a real publisher because it's not. And I got to tell you something, this doesn't really look like a real book. Um, it's not well written. It's not well organized. There are big chunks of text and image that look like they are, you know, the... Uh, the appendix to an appendix or something. And there are, there are, so this is a huge book. I think we got about 600 pages, but there are large parts of it. You would not read. So there's like 700 pages of text. So, you know, you get transcripts and all this stuff. So look guys, maybe there are 150 pages of text in here that would really interest you. Now that could be a good thing because you probably don't have time to read 700 pages of text, right? But I just mentioned the book is shorter than it appears to be. 
Um, he published several similar books before this, and this is the summation of his research uh, covering under many headings. Which is, I'm not against that. I'm not against someone writing the same book again and again, so to speak, and updating and expanding and improving it. But I have to say, this is not um, a literary masterpiece. And the question I have for you, and one of the reasons I bought this book, I've heard many, by the way, I've heard many interviews with this guy over the years, uh, William Pepper. He's been on the talk show circuit and he's been on the, U the YouTube circuit and the podcast circuit. But, you know, even before he's been on broadcast television and broadcast radio for many, many years, raising the question of who really killed uh, Dr. Martin, Martin Luther King Jr. The question is, ultimately, did he prove this? I do already feel I have a good understanding of exactly what happened and why in the uh, death of Martin Luther King Jr. But understanding what happened and being able to present something as a proven, established fact, these are two very different things. Now, likewise, I just mentioned, I feel I have a totally good understanding of what happened with the assassination of JFK. You know, However, you know, could you prove in a court of law that precisely this happened in this way for these reasons? as opposed to speaking in broad brushstroke generalities of what happened and why. Uh, so one reason to pay the money to get this book, get it out of the library, what have you, is just ask the question, can it be proven? And if William Pepper couldn't prove it in so many decades, then I guess nobody can. So I will give you guys the uh, link to a YouTube video here. If you want just a kind of three minute introduction to this. Okay, the infamous TV judge, Judge Joe Brown, who was also involved in uh, the court cases that were appealing the conviction of James Earl Ray. So in the first three minutes of this eight-minute video, you will be made to understand. I mean, if you want to put three minutes into this sometime, this will in three minutes let you know that there are palpable, incontrovertible, scientifically verified facts that prove that the official government version of events cannot be true. So the most obvious, this comes up in the assassination of JFK, and it comes with the assassination of RFK, are just uh, ballistics. So the science of ballistics, which bullet comes from which kind of gun. So if people say he was shot with this rifle, but the actual bullet that entered his body doesn't match with that rifle, it's not the right rifle for that kind of bullet. There are some simple, palpable, incontrovertible scientific facts like that. That means that one version of events is not true. But as I say, the fact, like the fact that you can say with the assassination of JFK, for example, that the magic bullet theory is preposterous or is false, so that we can prove that theory is false. Okay, that's one thing. But then is there a different theory? Is there a difference with which you can prove is correct? So the onus is on the author here, William Pepper, not just to uh, demolish misconceptions about the assassination of uh, Martin Luther King Jr., but to actually establish new and different uh, historical facts. So someone from the audience uh, paid five dollars, five euros, in fact. I just mentioned, guys, um, I used to post how much and how little money I make on YouTube <laughs> uh, on my blog all the time. This, So this five dollar donation, that will basically be all the money generated by this broadcast. I mean, maybe 20 cents or something will be generated by YouTube ad center revenue. If you'd like, I could post that. You know, I could post that information. Now, obviously, if you get 20 cents for every video, it does add up to something over time. Uh, certainly, I make more than 100 US dollars a month from YouTube right now. I can get you guys the exact numbers, but it is very, very little. So I just say a $5 donation. I appreciate it. And also, that will basically be 99% of the revenue generated for this for this podcast will be donations of this kind. This podcast, this live stream, this YouTube video, in whatever format you encounter this content, we're, uh, we're producing together right now. Okay, so Wicked Energy writes in with five five euro donation. Speaking of, uh -huh, have you had any comments on Richard Stallman or the free as in liberty software movement? Okay, um, <laughs> I'm joking around. If you own one of these devices, you can't say the name of the robot without it responding. So he's asking about my robot companion here. Um, Alexa, how tall is Joe Biden? Joe Biden is 60 tall. There you go. Uh, but if I mention her name, she'll start listening and respond to what we're saying. So unless we want to join the, want to join the conversation. So have I, do I have any comments on the, the free software movement? Guys, I, I have made videos talking about this before. My overall approach to this is to criticize the ongoing history we have, which is sadly centered in the United States of America, of uh, intellectual property rights, of copyright. 
So let me see if I can get you the link of that. I do think we need to very, very fundamentally. Oh, I don't know if I can get you that video. I'm sorry. Um, it may take too long. I don't want you guys to have to sit here. Oh, here we go. So the title of the video is The Public Domain, a copy. Pa pardon me. The Public Domain, colon, Star Wars should be deregulated. So there you go. Uh, I'll give you guys the link to that if you're interested. Uh, yeah, you know, I do think there is a need to very fundamentally and profoundly change our legal, ethical, philosophical approach to what intellectual property is, to what uh, copyright is, so on and so forth. Um, okay, Melissa, could you turn on that light now? It's just it's getting a little bit dimmer as the as the as the sun sets. It's a good time too. I have a very simple question. Oh, are you still in China? <laughs> You're more than a year out of date if you think I'm still in China. No, I'm, I'm not living in China now. I had to leave uh, Taiwan suddenly because of the conditions of uh, coronavirus quarantine. But I, I was living in Taiwan a year and a half ago, more than one year ago. I was, I was living in Taiwan, and I'm currently living in Canada. And indeed, I was promising to talk a little bit more about the politics of Canada in this video. Uh, question, have you seen the JFK movie Kevin Costner? I have. Uh, it is bullshit. I mean, if it inspires you to go out and learn something new and valuable, that's nice. Uh, you can watch all kinds of terrible movies that might inspire you to go <laughs> learn something new and valuable. You know, like I'm not, I'm not against that. You could watch Conan the Barbarian, for example. But no, I mean the um, the Kevin Costner movie. It's uh, it is a very strange fiction. You know, it, it lies about many things. But just very briefly, one of the most important lies in the JFK movie would be, um, you know, the attempt to make JFK into a peacenik hero who was going to end the Vietnam War and that the reason for JFK's assassination was that he was supposedly heroically about to end the Vietnam War, but then because he was assassinated, the Vietnam War went on longer. Um, you can look into what the origin of that, that myth is, but I think that is a really dangerous thing to be dishonest about uh, in the history of the United States, that JFK was a martyr for peace. Uh, that's not true at all. And you can take a look into what JFK did in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And you can take a look into what JFK's policy was on Cuba itself. <laughs> Or what he did in terms of diplomacy with the Russians. Uh, no, I mean, so there, there are a lot of really dangerous misconceptions there. However, if it gets you interested in understanding what really happened in history, um, as opposed to, you know, lies and half-truths that may have been told to you by your parents, your grandparents, or your high school teachers, then, you know, certainly, you know, more power to you. This is one of those moments we're going to change topic. Do you got a vote, babe? In particular, you want me to? You want me to? Do you want me to do Israel? Last time, there were people asking me to talk about Israel, and I demurred. So Israeli policy is one thing. Another issue that's on the top list today. Yeah, Canadian genocide. The uh, the question of yeah yeah yeah. Do you, you want me to do that next? Okay. So Melissa's vote. So one person in the audience says Israel. Yes. Melissa's vote is Canadian genocide. Yes. Oh gee, this fanning. This is good. <laughs> it's okay. No no no. I don't. I don't. It's fine. Um, uh, someone in the audience says, Eisel, can you please discuss the immorality of owning cats and dogs as pets? Now, you know, James, that really is something I've covered on the channel before. <laughs> I'm happy to have this kind of question. I don't mind. But I've got to invoke a uh, YouTuber's privilege here. Um, I have a memorable video called Your Cat Hates You. And there was another very memorable video called Your Dog Hates You. <laughs> Um, but no, I did many different uh, videos covering that. And there is a playlist called the Wildlife Management Par Paradigm. So let's just note that down. Wildlife Management Paradigm. Uh, do I have a, I might have a separate playlist of pets. Oh, one of the best videos is one I did with Melissa. So remember that? And it was like... Uh, no, no. <laughs> That's also a great one. Flush your emotional support hamster down the toilet. That's a great video. Yeah, that's that's what you were thinking of. Yeah. I was yeah, thinking of the, the one that we were putting together in China. We we talked about pet ownership, but I don't know if that's the one that you're thinking. Of. I uh, yeah, I was thinking of the one we did two handed, and it's it's like uh, companions are not captives. It's something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. So let me just see this. Like captive animals are not companion animals. Uh, so I've really yeah. So the actual the actual title. Oh, you look great in this video. By the way, the lighting is really working for you. 
Uh, captive animals are not companion animals. There you go. Now, guys, this is a prolix literature I am providing you with. This is hours and hours of viewing on the topic of the immorality of owning uh, dogs and cats. So, you know, oh, here's a great book. How far down in your reading list is the Mao book? Okay, well, which we have several Mao, but which one do you want to get? Are you thinking of which one are you thinking of, Alec? Maybe do you mean Tombstone? Do you mean yeah, right? How the red sun rose? Well, we have we have several. Okay, but I'll just oh, it's okay. I don't need to hold the book. It's okay. I, I can I can hold the books. Um, you, you know, uh, so Alec, I just say um, I, I definitely want to want to talk about ancient Rome here. Uh, but you know, um, uh, my assumption is that in September I'm going to be back in class at University of Victoria. So the assumption is I'm going to be going back to studying Chinese as a language and thinking and working a lot about politics of China. So it doesn't really make sense to be working on Mao Zedong or Chinese politics now. But the assumption is, come September, so this month, well, June, I'm going to be finishing my book. Um, and then we'll see how much time I do or don't put into physically printing or publishing the book. Uh, so this is my last chance to not worry about Mao Zedong and, and politics of China. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, um, as uh, as mentioned, uh, Melissa's vote was for Canadian genocide. We have other votes for for Israel. So Alec was in fact asking about how the sun, how the red sun rose. So yeah, that's when we yeah, yeah, yeah. well, no, but we have the other book. You remember the book about uh, the history of that's an even better book, the history of uh, agriculture in in communist China. Oh, that yeah, one, that's a great book, man. So this one, guys and. Yeah, yeah, we're we're passionate about these books. We just don't have them read it, guys. So there you go, Land Wars. This is one to check out, guys. And this guy did a really good uh, podcast interview. If you if you look him up, so his name is Brian Demare or Brian Brian Demar. I'd assume it's Demare, but hey, Brian Demare, uh, Land Wars. There's really and hey, look how thin this is. Look at that. There's a book that doesn't waste your time, guys. Look at that. Instead of I mean, how the red sun rose. That's a commitment. Jeez, woo. This is this is brief, man. If you do not include the end notes or the appendix. This is 166 pages. This is a lean, mean, nonfiction machine. So there you go. And again, for us, that can make a big difference. Like maybe between now and September, I can read this. Maybe we can both read it. That's a book we're both passionate about. Babe, can we share the jar of water? Can you just move it here so I can reach it? Yes. Thanks. Uh, I'm working up a, a sweat. Yeah. Okay, get the window. But if, if dogs start barking outside, we're going to have to close the window in. <laughs> so another great question uh why politics of china do you plan on moving back there well that's what my university degree is in so we if i finish this university degree then we presume i'm going to be thinking and talking more about politics of china and the chinese language uh, if i don't who knows okay guys so this is may 31st 2021 and the news story of the day is the genocide of canada's indigenous people something that you know <laughs> it's not the news story every which day, you know. Uh, so let me just ask you guys that. So you can answer this. What do you think the annual budget of NASA is for the United States of America? About $23 million, I believe. Right, I misspoke. $23 billion. Yep, memory serves. <laughs> So most recent budget was uh, $22.6 billion. So we can round that up to $23 billion. Um, annual budget for the Canadian Space Agency is $421 million. All right, so just, let's, just, let's just put that in perspective, okay? Now, you know, why don't you tell me something? Um, could you build paradise? in the middle of the Arizona desert for the last surviving members of the indigenous people there, the Navajo and so on, the Nadene. Those who, could you build paradise in the middle of the desert for $1 billion? How about 23 billion? How about 23 billion a year, year after year after year, right? If we're talking about money, okay, the United States of America has the money to solve this problem, they're spending it on the International Space Station. This is, this is the first thing to put in priority here, okay? It's put into perspective here is the question of priority. And people think about priority as if it is not a black and white ethical issue. And it is. It is. Matters of priority 
are questions of who gets to live and who gets to die. They are questions of right and wrong, good and evil. Matters of priority are not just questions like the one I was asked a few minutes ago. Oh, in what order are you going to read the books that you're reading? Okay. Governments make decisions that involve billions of dollars. Now, coming back to, um, you know, fundamental and profound issues of political science, political philosophy that go all the way back to ancient Greece and ancient Rome. You guys might or might not remember that I made a YouTube video talking about redistributing land ownership, right? That video, it has more than one conclusion, but I'll ask you this about land ownership. Certain radical left-wing groups in America still today are asking for the redistribution of land. They want land to be given to black people who are descendants of slaves. They want black, pardon me, they want black and indigenous people generally to receive land and they want in particular descendants of you know, uh, First Nations people, American Indians who were kicked off the land, to be given their land back. So this is a common refrain. This is, in fact, chanted by protesters in the United States. America, the chant is, quote, quote, unquote, land back. Grammatically, not the best chant, but I guess it rhymes with a lot of things. Okay, so this is one approach to politics, one approach to the political problem out there. Now, again, if you think about the budget for solving this problem, as being on about the same order as, as NASA's annual budget for space exploration. <laughs> if, you, if you think about it in the tens of billions of dollars in the United States of America and in the hundreds of millions of dollars uh, for tiny poverty-stricken Canada, you know, or a smaller and poorer country than the United States of America, then yes, at a cost of billions of dollars, you could, you could try to solve this problem through land redistribution. I tried to guide my audience to the conclusion in my earlier video talking about redistributing land ownership to, I tried to guide you to see the wisdom of instead thinking in terms of redistribution of opportunity, not of land. And one of the easiest and one of the most important ways to redistribute opportunity is through education. So the education system could indeed be described as the distribution of economic opportunity. Now, if you are Canadian, if you are born and raised and have lived your whole life in Canada, I can ask you, have you ever had a surgeon who was Cree or Ojibwe or Mohawk or Inuit? You know, have you ever met an architect who was Cree or Ojibwe or Mohawk or Inuit? If you think about all of the Cree and Ojibwe and Mohawk and Inuit people, all of the First Nations and Indigenous people you have met in all walks of life, what jobs did they have? What was their economic and social status in our society? Now, I'm not going to make the, the claim that there are zero Indigenous people in these types of elite professions, but to say they are underrepresented is an understatement. And if you are Canadian, and if you've been listening to the news today, it's the news story being talked about today, then you all know why. Okay, we had an education system that was designed to exterminate our indigenous people. Yes, cultural genocide, but it also involved eugenic methods of population control. Yes, some of them were directly killed. Some of them also were uh, castrated, chemically ca castrated. Um, I know of cases, and these are established as real historical fact, where just x-rays were used on the testicles of uh, First Nations men as, as boys in these schools to render them incapable of reproduction. So this is overt eugenic policy. Uh, so, you know, to reduce the number of children they're having and thus erase them from the map of Canada. So there were various methods of, you know, eugenic and cultural genocidal policy against them and also just outright simple genocide. And now apart from that, there was never any concept of excellence in the education program. There was never any idea that the school in a small town in northern British Columbia, which is where these corpses were discovered, by the way, it was Kamloops, right? so just up the road here. Um, it's a long road. Canada is a huge country. So the distance from here to Kamloops compared to a distance within England or within Europe, it's huge. But by Canadian standards, it's not that far from where I'm sitting right now. Small town in central central mountains of British Columbia. The idea that the high school where you educate indigenous people or the primary school, that this should be the envy of the Western world, 
that you should be able to take a photograph of this and say with pride, we're not like the Russians. We're not exterminating our indigenous people. Look at what the Soviet Union is doing to its indigenous people out in Siberia, out in you know the Asiatic expanse of the Eastern Russia, Eastern Soviet. Look at the terrible genocidal policies. We are not like that. We are providing our people with an education we're proud of and that they can be proud of. And our indigenous people are going to go on to become the architects and the surgeons and the senators and the leaders of our society, right? This kind of very simple idea of excellence, it was absent from the system of education. That was quite intentionally so. Now, I just say there are some parallels. The parallels are always imperfect. But, you know, um, in Australia, they had a special education system. That's, I don't know how well-known this is. This is something well-known to people like me. It is, it is well-known that they set up a special education system not for their indigenous people, but for the people who were half white and half indigenous. And it was the openly stated purpose of this special education program to train these people to basically be janitors, to take up the lowest forms of employment in the cities with the assumption or assertion being they would neither be accepted by the indigenous community nor by the white community. They would have to have this special status um, yeah, as as the lowest of the low in, in unskilled, you know, positions of, of labor and so on. Yeah. Now, you know, um, I know various anecdotes about what, you know, what the framers of the Canadian Constitution thought about our indigenous people and what their plans were for them. Primarily, their plan was for them to just not exist, right? But if you ask what kind of education were they being provided with? What kind of job training? What kind of preparation uh, for the world? I have done. I have done some research on this. I was used to be at First Nations University and so on. And it was always very instructive who the exceptions were, who was actually successful. So when you read about people who did well, who actually got a good education and led to a good job, I'm thinking of a real example, but I'm thinking of one in particular. But this is not a pattern you see again and again. There was a young man who was extremely talented at hockey. And in another case, it's a young man who's talented at lacrosse. And the teachers and the priests took him aside and were like, oh, well, we have to make sure you get good food because you're the you're the hockey, you're gonna be a hockey star, you know. And he was, he was, he was getting get ahead, going, Oh, uh, don't read the, the books the other kids are reading. We're, we're gonna provide you with better education and better tutoring because we know you're gonna go on to a real school or a real college, or you're gonna be in the league. You know, we don't want you to embarrass us, we don't want you to leave here like a semi-literate like these other kids. <laughs> The way in which people gathered around and supported this kind of talented youth who was treated as a positive exception because they were going to go on to be a hockey player or they're going to go on to be a lacrosse player or on the Olympic running team. In contrast to the other children who were being starved and beaten and raped and taught nothing and ended up semi-literate or completely illiterate or what have you. There's, there's a bad education in that sense. They didn't show up, you know, learned and prepared to go to college with absolutely no hope. Of, of going on to college and also no, like uh, it's not like, it's not like the German uh, system of, uh, you know, training you to have a, a career as an engineer or something like, sorry, Germany has famous for this kind of uh, technische Hochschule system where it's, there's a lot less emphasis on literature, but there's more emphasis on hands-on training where you learn how to work in a wood shop and work in a, with metal tools. No, 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 no. There's this really kind of this education system devised, you know, for o oppression for the sake of oppression and so on. Yeah. Um, the evils of the system are illustrated very well by examining the exceptions to the rule and then how their lives turned out and how they, they benefited from being taken aside and given, given this kind of uh, special treatment. Yeah. So, you know, um, when I hear the current discourse about First Nations people in Canada, the slow motion genocide and what's supposedly uh, being done about it now to rectify it, I'm furious. Um, uh, you know, Melissa hears me shouting sarcastic remarks, you know, at the radio. We don't need another statue. We don't need another memorial. We don't need another apology. We need change. We need profound systemic change from the bottom top. And what I hate most of all is when they claim, oh, and the federal government isn't going to be doing this alone. Oh, no, we're going to be doing this in partnership with Native people and, and their, their communities are going to be playing a leadership role. No, they're not. 
No, they're not. And that's precisely because of the education system. Because when you go to those communities, where are the surgeons? Where are the architects? Where are the lawyers among them? Where are the highly accomplished, highly erudite people who can sit down and play a leadership role in government? Now, again, I'm not going to say there are zero. If you go to Hobima, Alberta, one of the largest reservations by population in all of Canada, Go to Hobima, Alberta. You find you find just how few people there are who have succeeded in any career, in any metier. You know, again, again, the, the exceptions often are people who became athletes or musicians, things that don't require credentials and this kind of straight and narrow path that, you know, crucially involves high school, crucially involves the distribution of opportunity through education. But, you know, look, um, so, th so this, this is the defining tragedy of Canada in the 21st century. And it is the reason why my daughter was not born here and my daughter does not have Canadian citizenship. Now, my, I wonder if my ex-wife remembers this, but I said to my ex-wife when I dropped out of uh, First Nations University, so I, I guess I digress briefly to that. I was enrolled in learning Cree and Ojibwe at First Nations University. I was studying First Nations language and getting involved with activism for and research related to the political plight of these, these Native people. When I could not continue with that anymore because the program was garbage and the whole institution was garbage and the particular professors involved were garbage, there's only a small number of people, you know, define a program with that. And by the way, the other students were also garbage. There wasn't a single other student there uh, learning Cree, uh, really. And I, I can quote them on that. I, I, can, I can back up that claim. Um, I remember sitting with the professors just asking, do you know one other student? who is actually trying to learn this language. Because if I could just have one person to just repeat the sentences back and forth with, I would get some language practice, because currently there's zero in your department. You know, that would help me. That would encourage me. They said, no, there isn't anybody. It's only you. You're the only guy here to learn Cree. So, you know. And by the way, there were plenty of other students enrolled in the class, but that's not why they were there. They were not there to learn the language. It's another, it's another story. But yeah, sure, there's a critique of the students involved here, not just a critique of the, the professors and the, the institution. Um, um, I said to my ex-wife, my wife at the time, we were planning on having a baby. Baby was born. I said, look, if I can't be part of the solution, I do not want to be part of the problem. I'm not going to have my daughter born here. I'm not going to have my daughter raised here. I do not want my daughter to be a Canadian citizen. Now, yes, this directly has to do with the genocide and the fact that it was, the door was closed. It was going to be impossible for me to be part of the solution for me to be part of the politics of Cree language revival and activism and advocacy for native people. Yeah. And of course it's partly also because the actual education system in Canada is so awful. I wouldn't want my daughter to grow up in it, whether she were black or white. Um, and by the way, before my daughter was born, we didn't know to what extent she might come out looking black or white. My daughter is just partly uh, African in her ancestry. <laughs> Something it's something that was quite a big deal at the uh, at the hospital where we gave birth to her. By the way, <laughs> the uh, the doctors and nurses there were not cool with our ambiguous racial status. Bringing us back to the uh, anecdotes about racism in Australia and the British Empire, and everything else. Uh, so I want to say, sir, but wrapping up this this unit, wrapping up this section, guys. One of the main responses to the news in these last few days. It's very much news today. Uh, but it's, it's been talked about for just a couple of days now about uh, about 212 corpses being found on the site of one particular school. The estimate is that about 6,000 students were killed. That doesn't include newborn babies killed on site, newborn babies that were produced by the teachers raping the students, getting them pregnant, and then taking the babies and putting them directly in the furnace, which is an historically proven fact that that happened. It's not a theory. <laughs> Um, so there were corpses, especially of babies that were disposed of in furnaces that there are no remains of. There were other corpses buried on site where we do have evidence and we have eyewitness testimony and records. But it's like, and the use of shackles and the use of weapons, records mostly. One of the main responses from Canadians was to point out that there were schools for white people in the British Empire that were just as bad or even worse. Okay. And that is true. Okay, that's not an excuse, that's not an explanation, but it is true, and it is worthwhile to tell this story about how horribly we treated our indigenous people in the context of, for example, the, the so-called homeboy system, 
lot of you don't know, before homeboy was a slang term, it was a legal term. The system of homeschooled, home children, these, uh, the, the home children, that's what they were called, homeboys. Um, the various systems, I mean, ultimately even Anne of Green Gables is about, for how children were treated, if their parents were in debtor's prison, if they were sent out to the colonies because it was felt that the slums of London were overpopulated, there were all of these bizarre forms of, you know, kind of late Victorian and Edwardian, you know, ideas of education that were really absolutely awful. That's true. That's true. Okay. But nevertheless, you know, I'm, th th this is not to belittle one or the other. Don't dismiss how awful education was for one group of people by pointing to how awful Education was for another group of people, right? I mean, yeah, yes, it's important to understand that con context, right? And what, what, how does this matter today? That's this is a big part of understanding. How is it possible that the quality of education in Canada is so terrible for everybody today? Everybody, my education was terrible. I grew up in a labor neighborhood that had lead pipes. There was literally, I was given lead poisoning my whole fucking childhood in downtown Toronto. I went to a terrible school. I went to school with, you know, uh, newly relocated refugees from Chile and uh, around the world and new immigrants from Greece and South America and Africa and the Caribbean and so on. And we had a couple of Koreans. Um, I think we didn't have any Chinese kids in my school, but we had Koreans. So, but anyway, you know, I grew up in this, you know, multicultural fantasy of what Canada is supposed to be in the middle of downtown Toronto with lead pipes. I had a terrible education. My mother is a member of the Order of Canada. My mother is a knight in France. She's a chevalier. I am as elite, as privileged as anyone in Canada can be. I allegedly went to the best university in Canada, and it was terrible. Even I am the product of a terrible education system. And why is that? None of these institutions were built with the concept of the pursuit of excellence. Nobody was trying to create an institution that was excellent where you'd feel people are going to compete to be a part of this institution. People are going to be jealous of this institution. This is going to be better than the best university in Paris. This is going to be better than the best university in Berlin. This is going to be better than the university in London. There are going to be wealthy people in London, England saying, oh, we want to send our kid to this school in Canada. We want to send our kid to this university in Canada because they are the best. They are the best in the world at, at this topic, at what they do at their area of specialization. And the truth is that universities in Canada today are not even the best at teaching the Cree language, at teaching the Inuit language, at teaching the Mohawk language. We're not even the best in this one tiny field that we have a unique advantage where you'd think the Germans and the French and the Japanese would not be able to challenge us because we alone have these indigenous people. And anyway, Universities in Canada are not the best at anything. High schools in Canada are not the best at anything. And the shameful ignorance that you deal with... Okay. I used to know a lot of First Nations people. I used to know a lot of them. I've already described the context. When I was in Toronto, I knew a few. I did have a few First Nations friends in Toronto. But there, there are only a few around. I mean, I'm sorry, they're a tiny percentage. I did. I did have a few First Nations friends. When I lived in Saskatchewan, it was a First Nations university. I was talking to First Nations people every day. Cree, Ojibwe, Dene. You know, some from further away. You know, mostly from that area. Cree, Ojibwe, uh, Dene. Okay. And a lot of them spoke to me with shame and downcast eyes about, you know, how ignorant people were in their town where they came from in Canada. They'd say people, you know, they haven't read any books. They don't really know anything about history and that they're alcoholics that they spend all the time. This is how they talk. And sometimes they would say not terribly po positively or hopefully that they came to this university or they were trying to study because they were trying to, trying to rise above this background. And I would, so let's say they, they would be from some place like Hobima, Alberta, or some Hobima is a horrible Hopeless town, by the way. I'll just, I, well, I, anyway, I could give you a link to a video I made. I might as well. Um, this is a video I made. It's only about, uh, oh, I think it's shadow banned on my own channel. Channel. Maybe I can't get it. Yeah. So I'm censored by YouTube, so I can't get my own video. <sighs> Yeah, 
Anyway, I had a short video uh, on my channel that um, is called Canada, a country that's very different from its propaganda. And that includes some short clips of what life is. It's only about two minutes long. Shows some clips of what life is like in Hobima, specifically uh, Hobima, Alberta. Um, so yeah, guys, when you search within my channel, some videos won't come up. They'll be invisible. And that's one of the reasons why I made this separate website. So if you search here and you put in like even the word Canada propaganda, well, I guess propaganda or something is a good, a good uh, search term to use. And uh, you can find this, this video that's called Canada kind of is very different from its propaganda. Might as well just pause to show this guys. These guys, this is when I allude to what uh, hopelessness of life and Hobima is like. Oh, now I just have to click through every single video that has propaganda and its description. Here we go. Canada, a country that doesn't resemble its propaganda. That's the video. So, if you want to know about the kind of hopelessness of uh, what that's like, that link will will take you to it. Um, anyway, so I'd meet these First Nations people, and they would be from a place like Hobima. They'd be from one place now. So guys, seeing that pause, I just want to point out, you've been with me here for one hour. There are 31 of you in the audience. Only 12 of you have hit thumbs up. I mean, you know, if you're sitting on the fence, if you're not sure <laughs> that this is a video worth watching, that's one thing. But it does actually help the live stream. It will be promoted to people. If all 30 of you hit the thumbs up button, then actually it'll be listed more on YouTube and more people could have been here during the last hour and more people could be here during the next hour or however long we, we go on with this live stream. So guys, it's fine. And I wouldn't say this in the first 15 or 30 minutes. If you just got here at the beginning, I understand if you're not sure what this is going to be about, you're not sure if you're going to enjoy it, fine. But if you hit the thumbs up button, it will help the YouTube channel. It will help this particular live stream. If you do it now, if you do it while the live stream is ongoing, it actually does promote it. It's advertised more than YouTube because then they think, oh, okay, 30 people are watching this and all 30 give the thumbs up. Okay. Um, some other people are going to watch this. Okay. So look, I talked to First Nations people. You can click on that link and you can see how hopeless and awful life is in Hobima, Alberta. And there were some other clips. They're not, it's not entirely about Hobima. You get some really striking vistas about how awful life is out there. They said, look, people in their community they come from, they're generally alcoholics and they're ignorant and everything's hopeless. And I'd say to them, so I did this, I had the same conversation many times with people from different First Nations community, First Nations communities. And I said, oh yeah. Tell me something. What's the nearest town? What's the nearest white settlement? Like what's the nearest small town there in the countryside that's full of white people? Because that is how these people live. There's there's one town over here that's all First Nations people, all Native people. There's one over here that's all white people. That's what rural Canada is like. And they would name the town and say, when you go there, what percentage of those people do you feel are alcoholics? You know? how well-read or well-educated are the white people who are living like just down the street from you, like in the nearest community out there. And every time they'd be kind of dumbstruck by that, they'd, they'd realize, whoa, that wasn't the comparison they were making in their own mind. They realized, and they would say in slightly different words every time, yeah, you're right. Like the rural communities down the road, and there'd be a couple, the one of the North, the one of the East, the one of the South, those are also completely populated by incredibly ignorant, poorly educated, alcoholic people. Wow, it's not just us. And that's that's really how they feel. They feel like on television, they see white people who are highly educated, highly erudite, sober, well-dressed, clean living. You know, like they have this image of white Western civilization through television. They watch a lot of television. I mean, so so do we all in Canada, you know, <laughs> you know. And then they see themselves. They look in the mirror and they look at their neighbor and they look at their parents and they look at the squalor and poverty and hopelessness and low levels of education and alcoholism. And that's the contrast they live with in their minds. And they're not thinking about the next town uh, down the street. One of the one of the people I said this to was over the internet. Most, I think all of the conversations except for this one were face-to-face -face conversations. But I remember once I talked to a Cree activist on the internet. So this is this is probably still on the internet somewhere. And I remember I just tried to make it easier to visualize. I said, have you ever gone to the nearest white town, white majority, small city or town out there near this, this reservation and gone and walked down the street on recycling day? 
So not everyone has this, but in Canada, commonly, there's one day of the week where people put out a blue plastic box in front of their house that's full of glass bottles, okay? And when you walk down the street, you can see who's an alcoholic. I mean, you walk down the street and you are seeing bottles of whiskey and bottles of wine. You are seeing bottles stacked up. Going, You see an indication of just how much drinking they are. And I said, if you did that, do you really think that the level of alcohol consumption is so much higher in your community than it is in the white community down the street or next door, you know, if you know those people. And I say most of the time, there's some level in which they do know those people. They have to deal with the alcoholic rednecks that live down the street, but they don't see it as a continuum. So the failure of our education system, it is not a tragedy for Indigenous people only. It's a tragedy for all of us. And to solve the problem, whether it takes $1 million or $10 million or $100 million or $10 billion a year every year, if we provide them with truly excellent education, the best education in the world, education that's so good that there are people in Paris and Berlin and London who say they want to come and study with the Mohawks. They want to go to that Mohawk University. They want to go because they're the best at something. You know, I'm not saying each university is going to be the best at everything. Maybe one of them is the best at surgery and one of them is the best at architecture. There could be a Mohawk school of architecture that is admired by the Germans in Berlin for the excellence of its programs. And what you would actually be doing is redistributing economic opportunity right? You can redistribute the land. You can. You can give people land to farm on. You can. But in terms of the failure, in terms of what went wrong in the last 50 years in Canada, a crucial concept to understand is redistributing opportunity, all right? I've made already videos talking about the ways in which redistribution of land is in some ways kind of a false idol. It creates some problems and it doesn't solve many of the problems people present to me. Okay, so I end here my segment on... Uh, <laughs> our ongoing slow motion genocide in, in Canada. I have a $10 donation from Charbel Hanna. So thank you, Charbel. Um, I assume we're going on to talking about Israel now as the main subject because that was number two in our elections for what, what topic we we're going we're to deal with. Um, but thank you for the donation. I mentioned earlier that my YouTube channel generates incredibly little money. And in the past, I've posted screenshots of exactly how much it was. I've also provided how much to my, uh, to my ex-wife's lawyer, for example. That's up. <laughs> I remember at one point my my lawyer asked me, "Can I provide an average amount for how much I earn from YouTube every month?" And I said, "No, an average amount would be very difficult, but I can tell you the precise amount because <laughs> that's the kind of thing it is with YouTube. So you can you can you can print out the exact amount. But thank you. Um, this YouTube video will generate basically zero money aside from donations of this kind or aside from support on Patreon." And thank you guys for everyone who's paying $1 a month. All right. And by the way, if you do join my Patreon, you get to read the chapters of my book now. So you can read, not all of them, but you can read at least the first five chapters of the book or something as PDFs immediately. This book that I've been mentioned, uh, mentioned repeatedly. Okay. So I'm going to read this question. Then I assume we're going to talk about uh, Israeli politics at some length. Uh, apologies if you've covered this. Uh, what is your view on the actions of Israel and Hamas in their missile firing? Is one side more justified than the other? Well, yeah, it was very. Uh, th thank you for the donation. It was a very broad question. Okay, but that we might get something more, uh, more specific here. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. James Newman regrets that he saw the live stream beginning earlier, but he was too busy to watch. Um, I think that's a good thing, James. I think it's good that you're busy. I'm happy to hear that you're busy. <laughs> You know what I mean? <laughs> it's virtuous to be busy in life, and I'm I'm glad to hear that you're busy. I'm I'm not terribly busy, and uh, uh, you know I think you and the audience are benefiting from that in innumerable ways, including including the stack of books I'm working my way through, and so and then sharing with you what I've managed to what I've managed to to get out of it. Um. Oh, okay. You, you know. <laughs> My main problem with the Israel-Palestine conflict is the left-wing misperception of the issue. Now, one of the reasons why that's my main problem is that I spend my life surrounded by left-wing people. It's difficult for me to imagine 
how different this video would be if living here in Canada or going to the university or even in my own family life, if I were surrounded by right-wing people and dealing with their misconceptions about or misperceptions of Israel, but I don't. But just a couple days ago, I sent a message to another vegan YouTuber. I will leave it anonymous as to who this is. But there was another vegan YouTuber who on Instagram had used these hashtags indicating that she supports Palestine, that she's anti-Israel and pro-Palestine and so on. And I said to her, look, I'd be happy to have you have a discussion with me. You can come on my next live stream or whether it's by Skype or whatever method. Um, I'm surprised to see that you're pro-Hamas. <laughs> but I'm quite happy to, I'm quite happy to, you know, discuss with you and talk you through the the political history and talk about what's going on. Now, she was shocked at that. And she wrote back saying that she didn't realize that she was identifying herself as pro Hamas in the hashtags. And she went on to say that she feels that she only wants to talk about veganism on YouTube and that she's not comfortable talking about the Israel Palestine conflict. She's not comfortable being judged by these hashtags she uses for what her political position is. And I wrote back to her in a charming and affable way. Like, I'm, I'm not going to. By the way, the first message was also, from my perspective, charming and affable. I wasn't insulting her or picking a fight with her. And I was being warm and friendly. I was genuinely encouraging her. Look, if you want to talk to me, I'm happy to talk to you about it. It didn't, it didn't say I'm going to prove you wrong or something. I'm going to be happy to talk through the political question. Um, But I said to her, look, come on. Live by the hashtag. Die by the hashtag. Of, co of course, people are going to judge your political opinions based on political statements you make <laughs> accompanied by a hashtag on a public platform like Instagram. People are also going to judge you by the slogan that it says on your t-shirt. If you photograph yourself wearing that t-shirt and put it on Instagram, yeah. come on, let's, let's be honest. Let's be honest. So that's one side of it. I think it's interesting that left-wing people get in fairly deep to the rationalization of, and the support for Hamas i.e. the terrorist leaders of the pro-Palestinian side in 2021, and specifically in the Gaza Strip, you know. And then they're shocked when they're not sort of confronted with this even, but just asked to discuss it, just asked to talk about it. Oh, so when did you decide to become a Hamas supporter? Let's, let's talk about it. <laughs> and I think if people really were detached about it, you probably could have a kind of interesting and productive uh, discussion about it. Um, I currently have one. Palestinian friend. In the past, I had two. <laughs> the one, one of them stopped being my friend because he became ex-vegan. Just mentioned that he became a meat eater. Really crazy meat eater too. He really went nuts. That guy. But anyway, I used to know. Uh, in the past, uh, back when I lived in Laos, I had a Palestinian friend. When I lived in Toronto, I had a Palestinian friend. Uh, maybe yeah. In different times in Toronto, I had two different Palestinian friends. I've known Palestinians. I've known people who were. Who, to whatever extent refugees, some of them didn't identify as refugees, but basically the reality was they left the region. You know, even if their legal status isn't refugee, they left the region because of how awful it is militarily and politically. Uh, some of them were wealthy too. Not all these are poor people, by the way. So that's why they may not have a, a status as, as a refugee. But, you know, whether I am talking to Palestinians themselves or I'm talking to left-wingers who have been brought into the orbit of this pro-Palestinian cause, you know, I ask them questions and then you see how they deal with their ability to answer or not answer. Now, the, to me, these are not gotcha questions. These are not barb questions. This is not setting a trap for somebody. I'll give you an example. So by the way, I'm happy to have 36 people in the audience now. We're now talking about Israel and Palestine. But guys, if you're here, all 37 of you, why don't you hit the thumbs up button? Why not have 36, 37 thumbs up? If you're sitting on the fence and you don't know yet, you can wait. You can wait five minutes or 10 minutes, but it really does help the channel. It really does help more people discover the live stream. If you hit the thumbs up button, more people will know this is going on and they can join in right now. So guys, you know, but if you're waiting to see just how offensive my view on the history of the Israel-Palestine conflict is, you can wait. You can wait and you can press the thumbs. You know what? You can press thumbs up now and you can change your mind and press thumbs down later. It's actually not indelible. You can change your mind on you. That's a good feature. All right. But the kind of question I ask in terms of shaping the discussion, and these are questions. They're not attacks. They're not insults. But I will ask a question line. You notice that it's called the West Bank. The West Bank of what? Do you know why it's called the West Bank? Do you know what its political status was before 
and how it gained the political status it has right now. I have never once, whether the person I'm speaking to was Palestinian or a white Westerner who was left wing and part of this pro-Palestinian cause, or a couple times probably was talking to Asian people. I've lived in Asia for a long time. You know, but whenever this came up, they were surprised or dumbfounded this. And to be fair, my current my current Palestinian friend, because I say I only have one at the moment, he did know this. He did know the answer. Like as I started talking about it, he was like, oh yeah, right. But it was so far from the top of his mind, you know, it was kind of forgotten about. It wasn't thought of as a currently important historical fact. It was something that at some point he'd read, at some point he'd been aware of. But you know, oh what what do you what do you mean? Right, the West Bank. This is just its name, right? Most people don't wonder how did Canada come to be called Canada, okay? The West Bank was a province of Jordan. It's the West Bank of Jordan. It was represented in elections in the Parliament of Jordan. The people there were Jordanian. Right? Let, let me ask you, right now in 2021, do you think that the Muslim people who are living in the West Bank would be better off if they were again a province of Jordan. And if they had elections, they weren't controlled by Hamas and they weren't controlled by the PLO, you know, they weren't controlled by Fatah, they weren't controlled by any Palestinian terrorist organization. If they had elections in a normal popular democracy where people competed for ideas and elected representatives who went to debate what government policy should be, in the same House of Parliament that they have in Jordan. Does that sound to you better or worse than being under a combination of Israeli occupation and the sort of semi-legitimate PLO, local governing policing organization that you've, that you've got right now? Now, again, most people find this very shocking. They've never considered this before. Oh, the West Bank was a province of a democracy called Jordan. Oh, the West Bank could be a province of Jordan again. Oh, that is a solution that's not a one-state solution, and it's not a two-state solution. That sounds like a three-state or a four-state solution. Now, how oppressed do you think the people who call themselves Palestinians, who are living in the West Bank, how oppressed do you think they would be? by Jordanians. Now, if you know these people face to face, if you know them, almost every single one of them has a family member who's living in Jordan. Like, oh yeah, yeah, my uncle's Jordanian, Jordanian, you know, they have they have family living across all of these borders. They know to what extent all of these people, if they are not exactly one and the same, are intimately connected with one another. I mean, al almost nobody feels like, oh no, the Jordanians, there's some foreign people who would be tremendously hostile. The hostility of the modern state of Jordan against the Palestinian people was created because the Palestinian radicals attempted to assassinate the royal family and the leaders in Jordan. Okay, There were acts of terrorism against the government of Jordan by the Palestinians, including acts of assassination, an attempted assassination, and the elite level in politics in Jordan became so pissed off with the people we now call the Palestinians in the West Bank that they decided that it would be in Jordan's interest, that they would be better off if they handed the West Bank over to Israel and recognized Israel as the legitimate government of the West Bank rather than trying to police it themselves, rather than trying to engage in anti-terrorism defense of themselves. If Jordan were to take over the West Bank, they would also have to get rid of Muslim radicals. They would have to deal with Hamas. They would have to deal with terrorist groups that are more extreme than Hamas. Like Hamas are not the most extreme. I mean, we've seen the rise and fall of ISIS and so on, right? Every Muslim government, including Saudi Arabia, engages in brutal tactics of political control to suppress Muslim radicals in the territory. The government of Saudi Arabia imprisons and tortures its own people to prevent Muslim radicals from taking over or influencing the government. And of course, the government of Saudi Arabia 
is itself a Muslim fundamentalist government, right? So these things are not mutually extricable, right? Basically, every single Muslim majority country, its government is to some extent or another in a state of siege against its own citizens because there are radical elements. And there are also some elements, by the way, that aren't necessarily radical in the same way as Hamas, but there will be elements that are allied with and working for Iran. Does this sound familiar? Does this sound like the politics of Iraq and Yemen? Yeah, heard of Yemen? <laughs> you know, so there will be some Muslims who are of a pro-Iranian political or religious inclination, and then the government of the Muslim majority nation is there would be some oppression in the West Bank if they were governed by the Jordanians and if they were electing people to parliament and participating in the same parliament as Jordanians. However, obviously, the majority of reasonable people, people who are not radical Muslim fundamentalists in the West Bank today, they would be more comfortable being ruled by and being a part of one government with Jordan than being ruled by the Israelis, right? The Gaza Strip. What would happen if it were ruled by Egypt? What would happen if we gave up the pretense that this tiny piece of land ought to be and must be its own country governed by Hamas? <laughs> There's no chance now for the Gaza Strip even that it could be governed by Fatah or the PLO, right? What if they elected representatives? What if they participated in the same government as the rest of Egypt? What if all that hatred and resentment and anti-Semitism against Israel were allowed to depressurize in the relative enormity of Egypt, right? Egypt is in every important sense, a bigger country than Israel I mean, in terms of the number of millions of people, in terms of the economic opportunity, right? What we have created partly through United Nations policy, partly through Israel's policy, sure, is a culture of perpetual dependence on the status of being a refugee within your own country, the Palestinian, you know, refugee agency set up by the United Nations, a uh, perpetual, you know, handouts, which is indeed, indeed, those handouts are feeding and arming Hamas, you know, people being educated in schools that really the schools that Palestinians go to, they do radicalize them. They do take, teach them to hate Israel. They do teach them that they have this unique political, ethnic, and cultural identity as Palestinian. The reality is this distinct identity was carved out by, for in the West Bank, a lot of people, when the PLO took over, when this unique political status emerged, you know, in a sequence of wars with Israel, and again, with the rest of Jordan getting more and more fed up with the West Bank, right? A lot of people crossed the river and maintained their Jordanian citizenship and continued living in Jordan, right? It's the people who stayed behind. And now we're into several generations of people who have been raised in schools that are controlled by the PLO or by, you know, Hamas or worse, right? People who are given a radicalizing education and who are told that they are the indigenous people on this land and that their whole purpose is to kill the Jews. Anti-Semitism is not a minor or incidental feature of the Muslim faith. Um, who killed the Prophet Muhammad? Who poisoned the Prophet Muhammad? I ask people, they're often shocked at this question. What was her ethnicity? The woman who poisoned the Prophet Muhammad that led to him being permanently ill. He died several years later but he never did recover from the poisoning. It's maybe a simplification to say that the poisoning killed him, but it weakened him and sickened him and uh, led eventually to his, to his death. He was, he was poisoned by a Jewish woman, wasn't he? Oh, did you not know that? Do you really not know the extent to which the Muslim faith is profoundly and integrally anti-Semitic, that this is something they're raised with really from birth is this intense 
hatred against the Jews. How many Jews lived in Baghdad? Let's say in 1930, before World War II. Look it up. What was the Jewish population of Baghdad? Oh, and, and what's the Jewish population of Baghdad today? Oh, and where did they go? Oh, 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 really? Oh, and what was the Jewish population in Iran? And what was the Jewish population in Uzbekistan? What was the Jewish population even in Egypt? All these places had ancient, continuous Jewish cultures, Jewish neighborhoods in the major cities. Oh, oh, real, oh! you weren't aware of that. Oh, 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 you thought Palestinians were the only refugees at the time. Why don't you look at the math? How many Jewish refugees were produced by the genuinely genocidal political circumstances that surrounded the creation of the state of Israel. And where did you expect them to go? The creation of the state of Israel is a tragedy in more ways than one, but it deserves to be asked of each and every one of these Arab states that claim that the state of Israel should not exist. Where are your Jews? You had a Jewish population. You had a Jewish minority right up to approximately World War II. And today, their descendants are either in Israel or in some cases they're in the United States of America. They fled because they had to flee. There was a period of time that scholars routinely refer to as the second Holocaust. More often what I see in scholar literature is people say the period of the fear of a second Holocaust, the potential second Holocaust, that right after World War II wrapped up and you have the beginnings of the creation of the state of Israel, that you have this militant rise of anti-Semitism across the Muslim world. I can't even say across the Arab world. Sorry, the Arab world is one thing. The Muslim world is another uh, geographically, right? Oh, yeah, there used to be there used to be a lot of Jews in Morocco. Remember, if you ever read 19th century travel logs, there used to be Jews in, in Egypt. You remember when Napoleon arrived in Egypt and everywhere he went, there were these big Jewish populations who came out and talked to him and interacted with the French soldiers. Where are they? Where are they today? All right. There was a huge relocation of the Jewish population from across the Muslim world, the Arab world, etc. Yeah. And... Turkey is remembered relatively positively in this history. When you talk to Israelis, they always feel like the Turks were the exceptions. The Turks were, were okay, that they weren't part of this. Uh, but a lot of Jews got uncomfortable and moved this way also, right? So, yeah, although it is tragic that in this creation of the state of Israel, some people lost their homes. The telling of this story with the left wing of the 21st century presents it as if only Muslims lost their homes and not Jews. And the reality is precisely the Jews who were being resettled into Israel were people who just had lost their homes. Some of them had just lost their homes in Baghdad. Some of them had just lost their homes across the region. And they had been resettled into Israel. And the people we call Palestinians, yes, some of them did lose their homes. But they also were engaged in an armed and genuinely genocidal series of uprisings against the Israelis. Many of them, I mean, in, in most cases, based on everything I've read and know of, it's not even the case that they were formally kicked out of the state of Israel as it became, but it was just that they were aware that they had been engaged in an armed struggle against Israel. They had been out shooting people in the streets. They had been out fighting. And they say, oh, we lost the war. We got to go. We got to retreat. Like where they just literally retreated, they ran away in that sense, like in terms of a moving war battlefront, you know, and that they were combatants, they were engaged in the struggle, you could say, to prevent the rise of the state of Israel or to push Israel into the ocean, they would say, right? This was a war that was fought, not, I was going to say on two sides, on many sides. This is what created the state of Israel. So it was a tragedy on many sides for many different people, right? Let's ask, let, this wraps up what I have to say about the current Israel-Palestine conflict. But let me just ask broadly, do I support the state of Israel? Do I support the state of Saudi Arabia? No. I say no to both 
for the same reason. I don't support any government that is based on, in this sense, theocracy. I do not support religious apartheid. I do not support religion, period. <laughs> I'm an atheist and I'm a nihilistic atheist. I think the relationship between church and state in Israel is toxic and shouldn't exist in the 21st century. And I don't think it should exist in Saudi Arabia either. The reality is that Americans and Europeans support the state of Israel today because of a small minority of Jewish people in Israel who resemble in their cultural, political, democratic values, Europeans and Americans. Right? The reality is Europe and the United States of America do not support Orthodox Jews or Orthodox Judaism or the Haredi or what have you. They do not support religious fundamentalists in the Jewish faith. I think, pardon me, I think it deserves to be said that sympathy and support for Israel only exists in as much as Israel resembles a secular Western democracy, but it is a resemblance only. I have heard right-wingers, I've heard conservatives many times say proudly, if you travel throughout the whole region, i.e. Egypt, Syria, Jordan, what have you, you know where you know where gay people are comfortable. You know where you can be openly homosexual and have you know Israel. Israel is the only place where you can have a gay nightclub and where there's an open kind of gay subculture that is surrounded by these Muslim states where it's terrible. <sighs> have you talked to anyone who opens or operates a gay nightclub in Israel? <laughs> there are Orthodox Jews constantly trying to shut down the gay nightclubs in Israel. Like, it's true. There are gay nightclubs. Of course, it's it's better and safer to be homosexual in Israel than it is in Saudi Arabia or Syria or uh, Iraq even, uh, or Iran or Egypt. You know, it's true. But to say there's a tension is an understatement. You're talking about a country where really the majority of people uh, are religious fundamentalist maniacs. And I have no sympathy in this sense for Zionism or for... Um, you know, politicize Judaism as a religion. If there were uh, a Christian country anywhere in the world that was as Christian as Israel is Jewish, you know, I wouldn't support the existence of that uh, government either. If, uh, if, if Italy became uh, conquered by the Vatican City, you know, if you said a papal state uh, take over the government of Italy, it's, it's unimaginable now, of course. But if you had a theocratic government in Italy, again, one might say, if they were turned to this, I would, of course, say this is a terrible step forward for democracy. So in this sense, the very premise of Israel is, you know, it's made absurd. It's made risible. It's made immoral by what the Israeli government really is. However, people support the existence of the state of Israel because they support people like me. I'm a Jewish dissident intellectual, and they support people like Jerry Seinfeld. And the fantasy is that people like me and Jerry Seinfeld can build a utopia for Western democratic values in Jerusalem, in the in the Sinai Desert, you know, in the in the middle of this terrible war zone. And you know what? Maybe the truth is we can't. You know, I, I get that dream. I mean, that really is a kind of perfect colonialist fantasy, isn't it? You know, but the reality is. That what the state of Israel is now, and if you look at the demographics, what it is going to become. Because guess who has more babies? Do you think the people like me and Jerry Seinfeld have 10 kids each? No. You know, guess who does have families with 10 kids each? Guess what kind of person is raising 10 kids with extremist values? The reality is that both sides of the conflict, both the Palestinian side and the Israeli side, it is becoming only more fundamentalist with time. Um, predominantly and proportionately. Uh, it is becoming populated by and politically controlled by people that I would very readily describe as uh, religious fanatics. Okay, guys. So the title of this YouTube video was Politics, Israel, Ancient Rome, Canadian Genocide, Martin Luther King Jr.'s Assassination. So we have, we have covered almost everything. So I can do a brief reading here. I've got some... Um, I've got some readings from Appian. I don't even have to read it to you. I could, I mean, well, I could read a paragraph or two. I could just talk about it. So if you guys don't know Appian, um, I'm just going to give you his name. Oh, we got to capitalize 
I think we have to capitalize both the A in ancient and the R in Rome, you know. Uh, but I'll give you a reading from Appian, who's made a big impression on me. But anyway, I'll just briefly, uh, you know, scroll through some of these some of these comments. Thank you guys, by the way, for hitting the thumbs up button. As requested, we now got uh, more than thirty thumbs up, and as I mentioned, it does actually. Uh, yeah. So, question about the um, the Discord server anymore? Uh, that's right. I have deleted it and moved on. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. So, exe comments. A similar question to ask people. So it depends which way the conversation goes. I mean, when I'm talking about real life conversation with these people, would Israelis live better lives if the whole area became Palestine? And he answers, hell no. Um, so look, it, it depends what you're talking about and what the purpose of the conversation is. But sure, sometimes it's important to really illustrate to people just how genocidal the intent of the other side is. And uh, we've just seen the rise and the fall of the Islamic State. And, you know, the form of genocide that Islam engages in, not just in the ancient past, but still today with the rise and fall of ISIS, it does also involve slavery and specifically sex slavery. That's one of the main motivations for the uh, extremists with ISIS. So what it is to be conquered by a Muslim fundamentalist army or by Muslim fundamentalist terrorists and what that would entail, what kind of, you know, what kind of tragedy that would be. That is something we're thinking about, not just in Israel, but also in Afghanistan. And it's a question. I, I don't know if this will happen, but would Joe Biden sit idly by if the pro-democracy minority in Afghanistan were now going to be enslaved and raped by the Taliban and other, I mean, ISIS and other religious fundamentalists of that kind? Uh, conquering it and destroying the democracy and destroying the education system that the Americans worked so hard to to build up there. Um, I doubt it. And would anyone want to sit idly by if Hamas were to do this to Israel? And yes, it is not inappropriate to say to the women of Israel because the policy, and again, this is in the Quran and it's in the Hadith and it's in the history of Islam. The, the policy is of killing the men and enslaving, uh, sexually enslaving uh, the surviving women. That is, that is what Islam as a religion is built on. And we've had it demonstrated to us vividly by the very recent history of ISIS. Uh, so don't kid yourself about that. Being conquered by Buddhists has advantages and disadvantages. <laughs> but, you know, what would it be like if Israel were conquered by Thailand? Not so bad. <laughs> I, I, I'm not saying I would particularly prefer to be ruled. That's okay. That's a difficult question. Would Would you rather be ruled by the king of Thailand or by the uh, or by Benjamin Netanyahu, the current uh, government of Israel? Tough choice. But yes, yeah. I mean, you know, the stakes are the stakes are very high, and the the consequences are, are very very serious. And that's why, for the most part, you know, everyone expects that um, all of the Western powers are just going to continue to support the perpetuation of the status quo. Forever and ever. And the status quo works for some people, including some people in the PLO and some people in Hamas. You know. Do, 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 do. There was the possibility under Donald Trump that things were fundamentally going to change and things did start to change in Israel. I give all the credit for that to his, uh, his son in law, Jared Kushner. But now with Joe Biden, I assume that the policy on Israel is just going to be to maintain. Uh, the same situation have nothing at all change. And again, the actual oh, sorry, let's let's just note both Egypt and Jordan are pro-Israel. They're anti-Hamas and they're anti-PLO. And now, in effect, they're anti-Palestinian. And many Palestinians would complain about that too. I mean, now in reality, up until now, uh, Saudi Arabia has been pro-American and pro-Israel, anti-Hamas, anti-PLO. So, you know, and many Palestinians will complain about that, that they're surrounded by enemies and they tend to cling to, they feel they have positive support from Syria, that Syria alone is pro-Palestinian, pro-Hamas, pro pro-PLO and pro-other, in favor of other organizations. And Syria is still technically in a state of war against Thailand. Sorry, against, against Thailand. Yes. <laughs> Syria still is uh, at a state of war with, with Israel. Yeah. So, all right. So guys, that's, that's the end of that. Um... Say a little bit about Appian and then call it 
call it call it off for the night. Um, this is Appian describing to you the way in which slavery destroyed the Roman Empire. This is from Appian's book on the Civil Wars. Um, book one. The Romans, as they subdued the Italian people successively in war, used to seize a part of their lands and build towns there, or enroll colonists of their own to occupy those already existing. And their idea was to use these as outposts. But of the land acquired by war, they assigned the cultivated part forthwith to the colonists, or sold or leased it, since they had no leisure as yet to allot the part which then lay desolated by war, which was generally the greater part, they made proclamation in the meantime that those who were going to work it might do so for a toll of the yearly crops, a tenth of the grain, and a fifth of the fruit. From those who kept flocks was required a toll of the animals, both oxen and small cattle. They did these things in order to multiply the Italian race, which they considered the most laborious of peoples, so that they might have plenty of allies at home. But the very opposite thing happened. For the rich, getting possession of the greater part of the undistributed lands, and being emboldened by the lapse of time to believe that they would never be dispossessed, absorbing any adjacent strips and, the, and their poor neighbor's allotments, partly by purchase under persuasion and partly by force, came to cultivate vast tracts instead of single estates, using slaves as laborers and herdsmen, lest free laborers should be drawn from agriculture into the army. At the same time, the ownership of slaves brought them great gain from the multitude of their progeny, who increased because they were exempt from military service. Thus, certain powerful men became extremely rich, and the race of slaves multiplied throughout the country, while the Italian people dwindled in numbers and strength, being oppressed by penury, taxes, and military service. What's fascinating to me about Appian is, this is not the subtext. This isn't an interpretation I have to present to you. This is right up on the surface, you know. So what he is explaining is that the Romans had very rapidly conquered a huge amount of land. And the assumption was that this land would be distributed in small parcels to the soldiers, soldiers who had engaged in conquering it. The soldiers were citizens. The soldiers paid taxes and did compulsory military service. And this would be some relatively egalitarian arrangement. Like, whereas in Rome, a small number of people, you know, had, uh, you know, all the, uh, had all the wealth and fortune. It's a very unequal society that by expanding, they would create a more equal society. But instead, they ended up creating a much more unequal one. Um, instead, they created a society in which a small number of families owned huge tracts of land. And the farmers who were working on that land were not Italian, were not Roman citizens, were not the soldiers. They were slaves. Slaves don't pay taxes. Slaves don't do military service. And I would just note, this is an historical circumstance in which actually the slaves, who are referred to as being a different race from the Italians, the slaves were actually whiter skinned than the slave owners, than the Italians. This is a situation the people being enslaved were from places that are today, Germany and France and Denmark and what have you. Uh, also, uh, some way into Eastern Europe. In this period, I don't know if they were as far as Romania yet, but they went a fair, fair ways east into Eastern Europe. And, you know, uh, anyway, but anyway, these were white skinned and fair haired peoples who were being enslaved and brought to Italy as slaves. And who, as they were saying, were of a different quote unquote race from the Italians. They look somewhat different, obviously, but this is not actually a scenario of white people uh, enslaving black people. Not that I'm suggesting to you the, the Roman Empire was morally opposed to enslaving black people, but the mass phenomenon they're talking about here of the change in the ethnic character of, of Italy under this system actually was a, a Europeanization of Italy in this case, bringing in slaves uh, from the areas that have been conquered in the north, including by people like, in case you haven't heard of him, uh, Julius Caesar. Anyway, so we get a really kind of um, inspiringly brutal and honest account of how republicanism is incompatible with slavery and how republicanism is incompatible with extreme inequality. But then also 
the Republic was incapable of engaging in the redistribution of land, the redistribution of wealth, and so the Republic had to die. Appian's History of the Civil War, book one, a tremendously moving and meaningful book, and one that has much more relevance to politics in the United States of America today, politics in Western Europe today, than the whole discourse of 19th century German philosophy, including Karl Marx, that attempted to talk honestly about social class, class war, class struggle. Gotta tell you something, if you're interested in class struggle, its importance politically, past, present, and future, I recommend some, you take some time to read Appian.